Bob Thompson, portfolio manager at Raymond James, joins us today to talk about where we are in the economic cycle, whether or not we're still in a recession, what investments he prefers in terms of asset classes, and where he sees us in the mining clock. Very important concept we're going to bring up. Uh, Bob, welcome back to Kitco. Great to see you again, David. Thanks. We're speaking on Wednesday, uh, November 4th today, the day after the election. Results still haven't come in. But uh, just this morning, it's looking like the odds are in Biden's favor. Now, before we talk about the election's impact on cri- uh, prices and gold, let's talk about where we are in the economic cycle. You were telling me offline that it's looking a lot like the late 1930s. Pretty strong statement, Bob. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, interesting. A, a lot of this depends on where we are in the credit cycle, right? If, if, if there's access to credit, then markets tend to go up. Business tends to do well. Uh, the problem is when you have too much credit in the system. So you have, you, you have a long-term credit cycle, and, and that's a long wave of about 70 years. And credit builds up to the point where it's excess credit is not really helping anymore. And that's kind of where we are. So at the end of this long-term credit cycle, what happens is that there gets to be this huge divergence between the wealthy and the poor, exactly what we're going on today. There gets to be trade wars. People get upset because they're not employed. They're making... Um, um, they're manufacturing somewhere else. Imports get to be an issue. Um, Currencies start to uh, devalue because obviously uh, governments try to do competing uh, devaluations to make themselves more competitive. So all of this we kind of saw in the late 1930s. But a a big one too is these tend to to happen after great financial crisis. So obviously 2008 and 2009, we can talk about how we really haven't recovered from that yet. But also in the uh, 1929, 1930, obviously we had uh, had had the Great Depression. But but a big part of it, which which tells me kind of we're at the end of this credit cycle, is populism becomes very popular. So people like to vote in people who say they have simple solutions to very complex problems. And we saw that in the late 1930s, that where this started to happen. Unfortunately. Um, sometimes the currency wars, competitive devaluations, et cetera, turn into real wars. Um, we're not there yet. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but, uh, you know, sometimes that's the case. Well, that, that's exactly what I was about to bring up, Bob, is that we know what happened after the 30s, after uh, populist leaders all around the world back then were voted in. We saw what happened right after that, World War II. Now, you're not saying it's going to happen right away, but do you see pockets of geopolitical risks build up around the world right now? Oh, definitely. I think I think we have you know more of that than we've seen in many, many, many years. You know, somebody said the other day that the U.S. is more divided um, than they have been at any time since the Civil War. You know, and that's that's the U.S. and that kind of goes throughout the world in in a lot of respects. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what are the major risks then that you're looking out for as an investor? You, you mentioned just you know political divide in the U.S. What else? Well, I, I think, you know, lots of things have been put off because we had trade wars. Um, you know, as I said, we're having, we're having currency wars. Um, I think there's going to be, you know, lots of issues between China and, uh, and the U.S. going forward because I think both parties have uh, decided that it's time to get a little tougher on what they perceive to be some issues with, with China. So I, I consider the geopolitical risk will continue. Obviously, that's, uh, that, that helps the gold sector. Um, but I think there's a lot of independent variables here, which are going to move, you know, kind of move the markets in different in different directions and give us a lot of volatility here until we get some sort of security or some sort of stability going forward. And, you know, I, I should mention one, one more thing, and that is, you know, there was a, a quote that I like to bring up, which says that democracy is always destined to fail. And this was from 19, 1780, actually. Man named Alexander Teitler, and he talked about the fact that at this point, after a couple hundred years of you know democratic countries uh, surviving, at this t- point in the cycle, what tends to happen is people tend to vote in the leaders that give them the most amount of free money from the from the public treasury, and I think we're starting to see that throughout the world. We're becoming extremely dependent upon government. We're we're all dependent upon social assistance. The government. Um, the economy, individuals, everybody's so over indebted 
that we now just are completely dependent upon uh, social assistance. Is this populist movement and this indebtedness, is this a result of the last financial crisis of 08, 09? Or was 08, 09 a result of a longer trend pointing you towards this? Right. 08, 09 was the result of, you know, kind of 20 years of printing money, not really allowing recessions to 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 happen, flooding the money, flooding uh, the system with liquidity. Remember, a recession is supposed to be when the over indebted go bankrupt because they can't pay their bills. Money is then allocated properly after that crisis happens. It's allocated properly to the people that were prudent um, and not to the people that were imprudent and over indebted. But unfortunately, what happened here in 2008 and 2009 is, you know, th think of this if your Visa card was overextended. Right. What you have to do is you have to pay back, pay down some of your debt. But what they've done is they've just got another visa card and they just run up the bill on that one to pay for your other debt with more debt. Like it, it doesn't work. Right. So so what what I was what I was going to say is that a recession is is when the system clears itself and it's a necessary component. It's a necessary thing to to get you moving forward again. And it seems like the governments around the world, the central banks, realize that we can never, ever have a recession again. We can never, ever have a proper recession again because the indebtedness is so high that even if we have a, a, a mild recession, it's going to wipe out the majority of governments, businesses, currencies, et cetera. Okay. Now, let, let's go back to the, uh, to the quote here by um, Alexander uh, Titler. So his quote was, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. And you, you, you brought up parallels with uh, government assistance. Why do you think that government assistance will, will, will lead to an end to democracy? I mean, that just sounds like Keynesian economics, right? You're right. We are addicted to government assistance. But why is that necessarily a bad thing for democracies? Well, remember, this doesn't happen overnight. It, it's a decade or two or three you know, process that, that happens. So I don't want to say that our whole system is going to crumble or that sort of thing, but we're moving in that direction because ultimately, you know, Alan Greenspan said a long time ago, somebody asked him, how long do people you know, go, go along with central banks continuously printing money? He said, well, central banks can continue to print money and it have a positive effect on the system until people lose confidence in the system. Right. When they lose confidence in the system, obviously, um, everything starts to break down. So I think that's what we're you know, starting to see here. People still have confidence in the system, but over time, that erodes and people look for alternative, uh, alternative solutions. Um, you know, Al Alexander Teitler wrote that in 1780, which is quite interesting. The United States wasn't even a country then, but it was a couple hundred years ago. And he said democracies last a couple hundred years. And, and, and the reason for that is because you, you, you start living above your means and you become over indebted to, uh, at, and you can't pay your bills anymore. What happens after that, Bob? Well, you know, I'm not saying a dictatorship is going to happen, but, but you start to get the rise of populism, right? You start to get more authoritarian rule and, and, and things like that because people say, you know, this is what we need in our economy. Um, you know, that, that is happening. I'm not saying the, the, the you know, democracy is going to fail. Not at all. We're, you know, we're, we've progressed a lot in the last couple hundred years, but we're tending in those directions. And, and I, I just want, you know, just think about this in a recession, for example, and, and why we seem to be in a recession right now. But we really aren't. When, when you look at asset prices around the world, in a recession, you get the market drop substantially and stay down there until the system clears itself. You get real estate that goes down 20, 30%. We're, we've got all-time high real estate prices. We've got almost all-time high stock prices. That is not what happens in a recession. So, you know, if your GDP goes down $1 in a recession for a country and the government prints $2 and puts that liquidity into the system, well, suddenly you've just covered up the recession, you haven't fixed the problem, but you've covered up the effects of a recession. I think that's what we have right now. Yeah, but Bob, the uh, the high asset prices, isn't that just a result of a uh, monetary stimulus? Isn't that, I mean, I mean we still have, uh, you know, record levels of unemployment. We still have low consumer spending. And, uh, you know, we still have uh, sluggish industrial demand. COVID lockdowns are happening again in Europe. So, you know, those are the, sort of the counter arguments to, as to why we might still be in a recession. What do you think? You, uh, yeah, we are in a recession as far as the numbers are concerned. But when you look at what's happening with the economy, 
it's 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 crazy when real estate prices are are soaring in, in Canada. They're they're at all time highs in the U.S. That's not what happens. That in a recession, people cut back. Financial institutions have to cut back in a recession, and that's a good thing over time. Um, so we really have a dichotomy right here. Yes, I think you know there's there's still a recession when you look at the numbers and the GDP. Um, but what's happening with with the markets because of the liquidity and the, and the central bank stimulus? Um, you know, it, it it's not it's not normal. What's what's happening? And a lot of people would say, well, that's the job of the central bank. Well, isn't that the job to provide a lot of liquidity? But what it's doing, unfortunately, is just creating more and more and more debt with not really a lot of uh, a lot of benefit. You got to clear the system once in a while. Is this uh, well? First of all, is this one could argue this is just a natural progression of things? But are, is this bad? Is this a, is this a troubling indicator for you? Right, the debt to GDP. Yes, it, it is. A, it is a troubling indicator. And, you know, the, the debt to GDP hasn't been this high since 1945. Uh, why why is that a, a problem? Be, because obviously interest rates, you know, do they have to stay at zero forever? I mean, if they ever normalize, um, you, you obviously can't pay off the debt at all. So what governments do is they realize that. So they say, okay, how do we make sure that our debt to GDP goes down over the next few years? What they do is they let inflation run, which is basically what the Fed has said they're going to they're going to do. And they keep interest rates very low. So what happens in that environment is you get a negative real rate of return. And if you look from 1945 to the early 1950s, it was several years there of, of high single digit negative real rates of return. And basically what happens there is, you know, if you buy a bond for a million dollars, you think you're getting your million dollars back in 10 years. But really, you're only getting five hundred thousand dollars back in your bond because of pushing the eaten away half of it. So that's what they're going to do again this time. And, you know, that, that creates a problem for, um, for, for bondholders, obviously. For bondholders. All right. So, yeah, we're going to talk about specific investment uh, classes in a bit, just a bit. So you're saying that the government's objective here is not to pay back the debts, but actually just inflate it away. Yeah, there you go. That, that, that's, that's correct. What does that's, that mean for the average consumer? Well, you know, in, inflation is probably higher than they say it is right now anyway. Um, but what it means for the average consumer is it becomes more and more and more difficult because the savers um, are being penalized in this environment, which you know, when you think of that, how crazy is that? The people who have saved their money um, for retirement are being penalized. The people who are over indebted and over indebted continue to be rewarded. So obviously that's a problem for the savers because somebody that's logically trying to invest their money to take an income from it's going to have you know their assets in, in inflated away, and it's going to be worth less in a few years than it is uh, than it is right now. You know, and there's only there's one investment that does the best in a negative real rate environment. I think we can. All right, uh, Bob. Uh, since you brought up parallels to the 30s and uh, 08, 09, let me run through a few scenarios with you, and just very briefly tell me how likely any of these scenarios will play out. So, housing bubble crash this time. Well, I think with interest rates at all-time lows like this and liquidity in the system, that's probably not going to happen in the short run. I mean, when we start to get um, over-indebted to the point where, you know, people, even at these low interest rates, can't pay their um, can't pay their mortgage payment, obviously that's going to be a problem. I don't think that's going to happen in the near future because they're making sure that there's enough liquidity in the system to provide people to take on more debt. Okay, well, uh, do you think that, uh, you know, Housing prices are fairly valued right now. I mean, you live in Vancouver, so. No, no. Uh, you know, it's interesting. No, housing prices are way, way overvalued. But remember, that doesn't mean that they're going to go down in the short run, right? Uh, they, they can stay up there for, for a long time, but there will be some sort of event uh, that, that happens that obviously causes people to, to, you know, rethink how much they can take. A lot of that is, is, is the credit, right? Normally, at this point, the banks would have, would have tightened up on credit. We would have had a correction, but the banks haven't had to tighten up on credit because you know mortgage-backed securities been being bought by this central bank of uh, Canada. Financial institution collapse, like Lehman Brothers. Yeah, you, you know, obviously there's a lot of leverage in the financial institutions, but uh, that's monitored pretty closely. And I think you know the Fed backstops there; they'll continue to provide enough liquidity to the to the system to avoid anything like that happening. Um, so it, it seems like we're more or less going to avoid another 08, 09 scenario, uh, is, is what you're saying. Uh, so what, what policies 
do uh, do governments need to take now to ensure that people return to work? Or I've heard the arguments that, uh, you know, just leave, leave the economy alone. It'll take care of itself. Is that what we should be doing? You know, I, I'm more of a believer in that. And maybe that's, you know, a little too harsh. But you, you got to let the excesses work themselves out so that capital gets allocated to the right spot. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, zombie companies running around that are the only reason they're in business is that there's liquidity in the system. And, uh, you know, in a normal environment, they would have been bankrupt. And that's not a good allocation of capital because capital gets allocated to those companies when it really shouldn't be. Um, so I, I really do think that, you know, the, the less you, you, you tinker with things, the better you'll be in the long run. But it seems like we're completely avoiding any short term pain here. For, for long-term gain. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's an issue in the, in the long run. I think we're already past that point. Okay. So uh, we've established your macro thesis now. We're entering a phase of populism where we already have been. Uh, low interest rates to continue. We're going to see inflation. Uh, real estate prices have been high and will probably continue to stay elevated. What does this mean for specific investment asset classes? What do you like right now in the markets? Right. Well, there's only one asset class that does extremely well in periods of uh, low or negative real rates of return. And that is gold and silver. So precious metals, generally speaking. Now, if we start to get inflation run, then all the other uh, metals uh, do relatively well too, because the US dollar starts to come down. So, you know, I think that's the environment we're in right now. I, you know, I, I like the gold sector because the stocks are nowhere near their highs. Their cash flows are are fantastic right now at these prices. Uh, gold is still underowned. You know, uh, the average institution still doesn't have very much gold in their portfolios, and it's such a small area. You know, people are going to look and say, if I'm getting paid half a percent or 0.8 percent on 10-year government bonds, there's got to be something that can protect me. And if we start to get some inflation, and that's where money starts to flow into the uh, into the gold sector. So I'm I'm positive on you know the gold price over time. I'm positive on you know, the, the gold stocks and the leverage that they provide. And um, I think I'm even more positive because it's still an under owned sector, right? You don't hear people talking about it all the time. What, what about uh, what about currencies? Now, we, we don't often talk about currencies in the show, but if you're, let's say you're assuming you know, higher gold prices, wouldn't that imply a lower dollar and hence maybe another cross currency would be higher as well? Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because you're right. We, we always think of the dollar as the, as, as the unit, and then gold goes up or, up or down in price compared to the dollar. Well, let's think of gold as the unit. If you think of gold as the unit, um, it's not that gold is going up in price. It's actually that the dollar is going down in price, right? So yes, they go hand in hand. If the dollar goes down in price, gold's going to go up in dollars. So yeah, that's that. I think that's what's, what's probably going to happen. And if you look at the, um, the, 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 the dollar index, you know, we we it kind of broke down here uh, for the last few months, and now we've been it's been rallying a bit, and I think that's a counter trend rally. And you know, if we if we get uh, significantly lower um, U.S. dollars, then that's going to translate into significantly higher um, gold prices. Let's talk about the mining clock now, Bob. You you and I have spoken about this several times before, but for the viewers who haven't watched our earlier segments, can you briefly explain what the mining clock is and where are we right now in the clock? Sure. You know, the reason I, I keep track of the mining clock is because we manage money for mining executives and there is no other industry on earth that is cyclical as the, as the, uh, as the mining industry. So you got to know where you are in the cycle so you don't do the round trip. In other words, go uh, get the highs and then lose, lose it all in the, next, uh, in the next bear market. And the mining clock is, is important because it kind of tells you what's happening in the mining sector. And that... Um, it uh, tells you how far along we are and where this is all going to end. And we're, you know, from, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, just so the viewers can uh, visualize this, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock is the terrible bear market that, that, that happens. Um, companies are over-indebted. Um, they tend to go bankrupt um, at 3 o'clock or they have to delever themselves dramatically. They have to sell assets off for 90 cents on the dollar. You know, they're getting rid of the corporate jets. They're downsizing. All these things that happen at the bottom of the cycle. That happened at the end of 2015. Then what happens is uh, metals prices start to stabilize. Um, around four o'clock, companies start to reduce their debt. 
They reduce actually their, their all in sustaining cost of production for whether it's copper, gold, silver, whatever the case is. And then they become cash flow positive, probably around four or five o'clock because the metals prices have stabilized. They're maybe going up a little bit and companies are starting to get cash flow positive. But I think this is very important for the mining sector and why it really doesn't matter um, who's in charge uh, politically is that companies then have to um, basically stop their pipelines again. They have to get uh, more deposits. You know, if a company is producing 5 million ounces of gold a year and they have 35 million ounces, you know, uh, of reserves, they're not going to have a company in seven years um, unless they go find some more uh, some more gold. So that's the case, uh, kind of where we are right now. Companies' costs have come down, you know, $1,000 probably, average all in sustaining. You know, gold's at 1900 That is a fabulous um, cash flow right now. Now, what, ha- what starts to happen is you get M&A. And that's probably where we are right now. And the clock's been stuck at 6.30 for a while because M&A was, uh, was put off because of some of the trade wars that were happening. Now M&A has been put off because of the uh, COVID crisis. But that doesn't mean that it's, that it's not going to come, right? These big companies have to buy these smaller companies, buy their deposits so that they have more reserves. And that tells us we're in a great spot right now for the, uh, um, in, in the mining cycle because we haven't had that M&A yet. Right. What happens with the m and is when it ha- when it comes, then it becomes extremely competitive and companies all start to try to outbid each other. Right. You get junior, junior companies that go public, et cetera. And then you get up to nine and ten o'clock when the m and is just ridiculous and they're way overpaying for other companies. They're getting over indebted and then the cycle starts all over again. So we're in a good spot right now in the uh, in the mining sector, no matter what happens politically. I've spoken to quite a few uh, mining executives who, who would agree that M&A is coming. Pierre Lasson, for one. They're, David Garofalo is another. Now, um, okay, so given that thesis, do you prefer the juniors or the seniors? Um, you know, I think everything represents good value right here, right here but something that hasn't been, um, I guess, rewarded a lot yet is the developers, right? The, the companies with good projects that are just putting their heads down you know, maybe you have a couple million ounces of gold at a good price, are doing their PEA, you know, those are, and have more exploration to do. So I think the developers are in a good place right now. You know, there'll, there'll be some big discoveries too. The juniors raised some money through private placements a lot in the last uh, six or eight months. So they're going to put that money into the ground and there'll be a big discovery found. And, and you know, that's going to create excitement with the juniors. But I think a solid area to be in is the, the developers. Obviously, the seniors have to be looking at that area. Those are going to be the first ones. Uh, First ones that they that they buy. Uh, we had a we had a pretty significant run in, in a lot of the juniors, and I, I think you know it's more to more is to come on that. But I, I do a, a, a newsletter for mining executives called the Gold Digger, and I wrote in the last couple of months. I said, you know, we're we're not certainly at a euphoria stage a couple of months ago with the juniors, but we're certainly at an excessive optimism stage. And I said, when, when we have accept, excessive optimism, we're going to get a correction. We're going to get a painful correction, which is what kind of what we're going through right now in the juniors. And then that sets us up for the next step uh, for the next upturn. Fantastic, Bob. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughts today. I, I, I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. Fantastic, David. Thanks a lot. Thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned.